Welcome to Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, where we explore how to build freedom through the entrepreneurial process. Our goal is to provide you with the tools and mindset needed to create your lifestyle of independence and flexibility. I'm your host, Justin Blinko, and today we have B. Byrne, CEO and co-founder of Clef. B. was recently named by Forbes as one of the top 30 entrepreneurs under 30, and we're very happy to have him on the show. B., welcome to Liberty Entrepreneurs. Awesome. Thanks, Justin. Glad to be here. At what point did you decide you wanted to be an entrepreneur? That's a good question. I took a pretty weird path to entrepreneurship. I started Clef while I was still in school. When I started school, my goal was to be an English professor. And I was like pretty sure that was the path I was going to take. A group of friends convinced me to take a computer science class as a joke because like I was so humanities oriented, but everyone thought it was funny that I would go do something like computer science. But I went to the computer science class, and on the first day of class, the professor said to us, uh, I'm going to teach you all how to write in a way that comes true. And if you follow some simple rules, you'll be able to create whole worlds, companies, products, whatever you can imagine. You just have to write it down, and it'll exist. And I thought that was the coolest thing I'd ever heard. And so I was pretty hooked. And I ended up actually studying both English and computer science. During, while I was still in school, uh, LinkedIn had its big password breach, which got me interested in sort of security and authentication. And I started working on a research project with a professor whose focus was cryptography. And then when I finished school, that research turned into Clef, which so I recruited two of the best engineers I knew, and we all started working on it full time. For those who don't know, could you give us a, a brief description of what Clef is? Yeah, so Clef is the best way to log in without passwords. It's a two-factor authentication where you don't have to actually type or remember anything. And the way it works is that, so the way you use it is that you walk up to any computer, hold your phone up to the screen, and you're logged in. And what's happening in the background is public key cryptography, which is the same technology that powers Bitcoin, where your private key is being held generated and then held on the phone, and a public key is held by the server, Clef server. And when you log in, there's basically sort of like this off request that uh, your phone grabs, signs with a private key, sends to the server, we verify it, and then log you in. So it ends up being much safer than traditional two-factor auth or other forms of authentication, but at the same time, a lot easier to use because there's nothing to remember or type. You and I met at a Bitcoin conference in Chicago, and I was pretty amazed to see your demo. Everyone hates usernames, passwords, having to remember it, losing them, and th that whole hassle. Why is the entire world not using Clef or something similar today? What's, what's in the way of that? Yeah, well, I think that in the next three or four years, we are all going to be using something like Clef. And that's not just like hubris about our product, but also, you know, Passwords that we can remember only work for three or four more years at protecting us from the sort of growing amount of computing power that attackers have access to. And so the, the question of like, why isn't it happening today is because there hasn't really been a good solution. And it's a pretty tough problem. There's a lot of different pieces to the problem. Currently, in the world of authentication, every website refigures it out themselves and like rebuilds their own system which is pretty ridiculous and everyone messes it up, but uh, that's the status quo. And it's also, there hasn't really been like a good alternative until we all had a smartphone in our pocket capable of cryptography that we were like comfortable using to identify ourselves. Something like Clef wasn't really possible. And you know, there are like those RSA tokens, which are like dedicated hardware that you could carry with you for two factor auth. Right, which many people did in, in the corporate world. And the reason for that is that they were super expensive and like very simple. Like they don't do as much cryptography work as your phone can do, and also they're super expensive, so they couldn't like work for mainstream uses. You know, I think the technology has just gotten to the place where there's an obvious path forward. Like our phones are going to be doing the authentication work, and now it's a question of distribution of how do we switch over a whole internet that has been built doing it one way over to doing it a new way. Uh, and that's the challenge we're trying to solve. You know, we think we feel like we've solved the problem of like, okay, we've got an interface that people love, we've got technology that's more secure, and now the challenge is how do we get that to be everywhere so that people can use it? That's what we wake up every day and try to do. Right. So that's that's the struggle. You, you've got the product, and now it's how do you uh, introduce it to people to get right. them actually using it, getting getting it to companies and then to the users. 
Exactly. So I was reading today that uh, you enjoy your co-founders. Um, yeah. You've, you've learned a lot from them and had to learn a lot working working alongside them. How do you make decisions having multiple multiple people in the room that you know are probably competent to make those decisions? When I started it with the two of them, we made every decision like sort of in tandem. You know, we talked everything over and came to agreement, and that was like very natural. That felt very comfortable for us. We get along very well. We're all heavily involved, very interested. So coming to consensus worked. Now that we've been doing this for a little while and our team has grown and you know there's a little bit more differentiation between the things we do every day. The real challenge is like, so we decide who is responsible for an outcome or a decision, and then that person makes the call at the end of the day. And so for the three of us, it was possible to do like by consensus, right? Like let's make sure everyone's on board. When we added our fourth and fifth, like the first two employees, it was like we would still sort of sit around and talk about things and then come to agreement. But as like even at four or five, that started to be uncomfortable. Like it was a lot of time that everyone had to take out of their day to make decisions that they don't didn't necessarily know all that much about or didn't care about. And then as we've grown past that, and we're now seven, uh, it's just become unwieldy for everyone to be involved in every decision. And so at this point, we really sort of choose for every action. And you know, if there's a marketing question, we're saying like, okay, we want to create some new marketing materials. Ika, Jessica, who leads our marketing team, will be responsible. And whatever decisions get made, she's the, the buck stops with her. She's going to get to make the call. And the rest of us might work with her and help with things, but ultimately it's her call. And we found that just having someone to make the decision makes things move much more quickly than trying to get everyone on the same page. This being your first startup, have you found it difficult to try to delegate that? Have there been times when you thought someone might be wrong, but you had to say, all right, uh, we, we decided on this, this system and, and I have to go with it, even if it doesn't feel right at this moment? When we first started hiring people, I definitely had that. We had a lot of things where it was just like, I, I felt so like deeply knowledgeable about Clef and like the people we had just hired. Like I had to hold their hand through every decision. But it turns out that I'm really busy with my own stuff. I hired someone to do marketing because they're better at marketing than I am. And right. I don't I don't want to be doing marketing. I wanna be, you know, right now like fundraising. And fundraising will take all of my time. And so for me to you know, try to manage every decision is totally implausible. And also, I'm wrong so much of the time. So even when I disagree, I, I'll voice my disagreement and say, like, hey, I think that this project is making this mistake and that could have this outcome. But I, I don't have any illusion that, like, I should be the one to evaluate whether or not my objection is right. What do you find is the hardest part about being a young co-founder? Obviously, you've already seen some recognition being a, a, a young entrepreneur from Forbes. Has that come with any difficulty? Technology industry is interesting because there's a sort of like a cult of youth that people really think that like innovation comes from young people, which I think is like truth and also untruth to that. Like, I'm, I have no idea what I'm doing a lot of the time. I hired a bunch of people to work at Clef, having never hired a person before in my life. And now I manage a bunch of people having never been a manager before Clef. Both of those were hard. You know, at every step of the way, I'm a noob at something that is like could be taken for granted uh, in someone who had experience. I think it could be argued that if you knew what you were doing, you would never try to revolutionize the security or, or authentication industry because everybody knows that passwords and usernames are how that's done. So maybe you could make them a little nicer somehow, but you wouldn't be thinking about it from a totally new direction where most industry in insiders probably say that's too crazy to work. Totally, totally. And I think that's the advantage, you know, so the advantage is I'm willing to do things in a way that's totally different than what's been done before, because I have no idea what's been done before. Uh, and the trade-off is that I will make dumb mistakes that totally could have been avoided. And I, I, I often say that my founder superpower is that I'm really good at asking for help. I do it all the time, and like 
I'm always admitting how little I know. <laughs> and the result has been that like I have mentors and advisors who will meet with me regularly and who are, you know, like incredibly, incredibly helpful because like they know that I'll listen to them. The first is I noticed that they were great at what they did and then I ask them for their help. And the result is that they feel like their help has an impact. Is that a skill that you've always had or is that something that you consciously tried to, to learn? I would say that I never needed it as much as I've needed it in a startup. So I've definitely gotten increasingly good at it, but it's always been my natural tendency. I'm a pretty like low ego kind of person. You know, like, I'm very not setting out to like prove how smart I am or how like good at this I am. I'm always, always trying to get better. And I think that that is sort of like a core personality trait. I'm not very competitive. I'm not like super ego driven, which, you know, perhaps competitiveness and ego drive are also valuable characteristics in a different kind of startup founder. But for me, that's resulted in the fact that I ask for help uh, pretty well and the help I've gotten has been invaluable. What's the, so Clef is headquartered in Oakland. What is the tech scene like there? Most people think of Silicon Valley, San Francisco as the hub. I can imagine it's, you know, kind of migrating out with costs and everything. Why, why did you choose Oakland and, and what's it like there? Oakland is a city that has this pretty amazing history of political activism. You know, this is the city that was the home to the Black Panther movement. When there's protests going on currently, you know, it's like there's a protest in New York, L.A. and Oakland. So That's it's true. this incredibly like engaged and community driven city, which is awesome. I, I love that about Oakland. And so the tech industry that's coming here, I think that the city of Oakland has this attitude of like uh, pride that like it wants to stay Oakland. And San Francisco has just gone through this radical transformation where it went from being like this uh, city of artists and creativity to now being a city of technology and wealth. And I think that Oakland is very resistant to the idea that like it should change. Uh, but at the same time, there's a sort of knowledge here that technology is coming. Like companies like Clef, which, you know, Clef has been here since we left school. So we're like grown in Oakland and we're deeply rooted in the city. And so the question is, how can the technology industry grow in Oakland without displacing the people who have been here for a long time and without sort of running over a city that has this awesome history? The tech economy here is very young, or, and I don't mean that in terms of like the people working here are young, but like a lot of the companies are pretty new. Uh, Pandora has been here for 15 years. It's a very cool place to be working right now because it's growing quickly. It's, everyone's very excited, but at the same time, like everyone's thinking a lot about the impact that the industry will have and how to make that impact as positive as possible, which is what we want to be focused on. When you look at the digital security industry, which you got into by mistake, you know, you didn't go to college <laughs> right. with getting an English major thinking that you wanted to get into this. What do few people know that you think everyone should? The most interesting thing is just how pervasive the issue is. I think it's coming to surface more and more. You know, right now there's the news about the FBI versus Apple iPhone case, and that's very public. But like our secure, our sort of digital security is relevant in way more places than people think. Like when people think about it, they're like, oh, like identity theft or fraud in my bank account. But it's also like the traffic lights around the city and the sort of phones that you call home on. And, you know, sort of every every device in our lives needs to be protected. For so long, we've been sort of like band-aiding together the system and like it's all paste and popsicle sticks of us trying to build an infrastructure really fast that then has tried to catch up and be like, OK, so we built a way to do voice phone calls and people are using it, but now we have to add something on top of it which will protect it. Instead of like, how do we build a secure way to send voice calls at the outset? Right. So I think that like the thing that, the deeper I've gotten into security, the more I've felt like this is an issue that's pervasive, it affects everyone every day. And at the same time, like it is woefully under 
developed. That's that that's both like scary from the perspective of like a consumer of like someone could do something malicious here. But it's also like exciting as an entrepreneur of just like there's so much in here that is going to change in the next 10 years. And it's really great to be building part of that. The possibilities of so much sort of need coupled with uh, such long-standing underdevelopment is a big opportunity delta. Big, yeah, big green field for, for you guys to... Right. And that's not to say that there haven't been smart people working hard on security because there have been tons of smart people working hard on security. We, we didn't like discover this problem. <laughs> if you talk to anyone who's been working in security, they'll say the same thing and they'll say that they've been saying it for 40 years. Right. But I think that the the curve of like as people come online, how how critical that sort of need becomes is what is making the opportunity so great right now. We have a lot of somewhat technical lis- listeners and, and listeners who are into, into Bitcoin. Could you explain what what risks do you run with having private keys on your phone when it comes to, you know, let's say Clef becomes that kind of universal login for everything? So the big challenge is that um, instead of something that's in your brain, which, you know, there's no possibility that a virus could get to your brain right now. Instead, this thing is going to be stored on a phone, which potentially some like advanced persistent threat could get access to. So particularly if you're on an Android device and you download an app that is malicious and it stays on your phone for a very long time, um, it's possible that it could eventually break into something like Clef and grab a key and then it has access to your accounts. That's the, the, ch- the challenge is like, okay, so if we're going to put more important information on your phone, we have to do a better and better job of protecting your phone. And Apple is currently in a legal battle to continue doing this, but has generally done a very good job of making that sort of the default, you know, to the detriment of other things about openness, but to the benefit of something like Clef. Whereas Android, it's more open, it's a little more porous and a little harder pr- to protect. Hmm. I think, though, that the, the, the perception there is that storing something in your brain is very safe versus storing it on the phone, which is like a place that is connected to the network. But the truth is that your brain can't remember anything that is good enough to protect you. It's just too small a box to keep a good secret. And so by putting something on the phone, we could just use a much, much, much better secret. As time goes on, what we're going to find is that our mobile devices will become increasingly personal. So a phone might become a watch, might become a thing under your skin or, you know, whatever. These, but these devices will get closer and closer to us. One of my recent interviews, do you know Martin Weissmeyer? He had, uh, he also goes by the moniker Mr. Bitcoin. And he became famous for implanting two NFC chips into his hands uh, that he uses to unlock his doors, to hold his uh, Bitcoin and, and, and other things. Exactly. Absolutely. And I think that's uh, that's exciting. And, you know, I'm not ready to do it yet. I have a pretty good friend who has a magnet in his middle finger uh, that, you know, so he can sense electromagnetic fields. I'm like, I'm not quite that far into the... <laughs> body mod, body hacking stuff. Yeah. But I think that as these devices get more personal, what's going to happen is that these devices will get to know us better. So uh, your phone might know your fingerprint now, but it may eventually know your cadence of walking or your heart rate or these things about you that are very hard to fake. And as long as it's sure it's still in your pocket or it's still in your bloodstream or wherever it is, it will keep being able to authenticate you to the devices around you. And then when it gets detached from you and it stops, it knows it's not with you anymore, then it stops authenticating you. And I think the first step of that is, okay, currently we have a mobile device that is pretty good at authenticating me with my fingerprint. How do we help it communicate to all the computers around me? And I call this the authentic computing revolution that over the last 50 years, we've had the personal computing revolution, which is about owning a computer. You know, we've gone from very few people owning one to now almost everyone owns one. Uh, And, you know, the mobile computing revolution has helped make that, help that reach a lot more people. But I think the next stage of 
our relationship with computers isn't about how many people own one, but instead, how do I inter how do I act with every computer as if I own it? So when I walk up to the dozens of computers or hundreds of computers that I would interface with every day, how do they each know me and how do they each sort of become mine as long as I'm using them? And I think that's the future of how we interact with machines, and I think it's really exciting. Yeah, I'm excited and both a little bit nervous as we move forward and, and more things become digitized and on the internet and need permission that's that's outside of the scope of human abilities of uh, how identity plays in that and who controls that identity or, or if it's identity at all or, or something else, you know, whether it's the, the current solution with centralized, you know, Facebook knows my username and password and they, they store that and then they keep my identity that it can then be used in other places or if it's something more controlled by end users. And I think that might have very broad implications for the way the world evolves technologically over the next you know, 50 years through this authentic computing time, as you call it. Absolutely. I think that the worst case scenario is that we get used to using our face to authenticate to things and then every device has a camera and it checks our image against a central server of faces and then it acts like it knows us because of that. Uh, I think that's the, the minority report future. Yeah, and, and you uh, see in airports these days facial recognition cameras and obviously that's based on the somewhat legacy identification cards with your face on it so that someone could see, oh yeah, he's got his uh, ID number and it matches his face. I'll tell you something even scarier is that I visited a company who had developed machines and I grew up in a military town. So this company was building machines for the government that could get your fingerprints as you walked by the machine from 20 feet away. Wow. And so like it was just fingerprint is for airports, although at the time had not been deployed and I haven't kept up with them. It's been a year since I talked to them, but they built a machine that you could walk past, like you could set it up and everyone who walks past it within 20 feet, you get their fingerprints. That made me very uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, it's becoming the new reality that machines and, and computers can sense th anything around them far better than what we're used to for humans. And yeah, it can get kind of scary when you think about what could be out there. I don't know if you've been watching, I'm a big Go player and over the last two days, Google's AlphaGo program has beat the, one of the world's best players in Go for the first time ever. What and, What is uh, Go? It's a board game that's like very complex, hmm. uh, yep. and computers have never beat humans at it. Like they beat some humans, but they've never been able to beat professional players. Right. And the estimate from the Go community was that uh, it would be 20 years before a computer could beat a top professional. The estimates from the AI community have been like 10 years or five to 10 years. And then it actually just happened this week. <laughs> and uh, it's amazing to watch because the game's like very complex. And if the computer makes uh, wrong moves, they don't even have to be big wrong moves. Even if it's like slightly off, it could lose the game very quickly. But instead it makes the right move every time. <laughs> and it's just so bizarre to watch because it seems like it's thinking. The feeling it's given me, and I'm sure that people had this feeling when Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov at chess. I just have this feeling that computers are getting smarter than us much more quick, or getting smarter much more quickly than we are. You know? Yeah. Like our intelligence is pretty fixed, and the computer's intelligence is growing. It is slightly scary. Luckily, we can somewhat utilize the intelligence of the devices to augment our own intelligence if we do it right. But yeah, it's... Totally. Totally. I, I, I feel like one weird thing about working in technology is that like you sort of necessarily get like involved in futurism and just sort of like trying to figure out what what will the world look like 10 years from now. Right. And I often say that if you try to look out 10 years or fewer, the technology you have today is what's going to sort of like build those next few years. But what gets very hard is that then all of the technology which will be built in that time will be the, like the catalyst for the change that happens afterwards. Yeah. So like today we can be like, okay, we have some like virtual reality and maybe virtual reality will become like a bigger deal in the next five or 10 years. 
But then to look past that, we have to understand like, okay, once people have virtual reality, what kind of tools will they build into it? What will they be able to do that's different than what we can do now? And how will that different perspective and those different abilities have them shape the world afterwards? And it just becomes exponentially more difficult to predict, but it's all moving very quickly. And it's definitely, you know, a lot, the world's gonna change. That reminds me of a, a quote from Jeff Bezos that I came across recently and, and he was being interviewed or, or giving a speech and he said, people ask me a lot what I think will change in the next 10 years. And it's an interesting question and I, I don't usually have a, a great answer for it. But he said, I think the more interesting question and how I've tried to build Amazon and the business around is what won't change in the next 10 or 20 years? Because those are the right. things that you can build a business on. And then, you know, the things that, that, that will change are, are very hard to predict. So, you know, for Amazon, it's obviously people are always going to want cheaper prices shipped to them as fast as possible. Right. That, that won't change in 10 years. Uh, everything else probably will. Well, I, I agree with him. I'd like to finish off with one entrepreneurial related question, then we can move into the lightning round um, okay. with a little bit faster uh, questions and answers. What do you know now that you wish you'd known when you started Clef? Oh my gosh, so much. I think <laughs> about it every day. I'm just like, if I could just go back and redo every decision with like my current knowledge, like I could have done everything so much faster. Right. Spent so much time learning. But that's also like the question you had earlier about being first time founder. It's like there's totally an illusion that as a second time founder, it would be easier. I always think like, oh, if I ever start another company, it'll be so easy because I won't make all of these same dumb mistakes. And I know that's not true because then I'll have a whole different set of problems. The biggest thing that sticks out to me is it took it takes so long to learn that there are no rules. It's so easy to show up and try it and do what's expected or what you think is expected of you. But in starting a company, you only win when you do something new or interesting. And so the desire of like, oh, how did this other company do this thing? Well, they spent a bunch of time on PR. I should spend a bunch of time on PR. But it's like you can't like you can't follow anyone else's path in entrepreneurship and end up at their same success. Like once they've done it, it's now not useful. So you have to invent it. And the truth is that like you're if you're solving an interesting problem or you're solving something new, you're going to have to be inventing a lot. And it can be hard to like break the mindset of like how do I follow what others have done and instead say how do I solve my problem better than anyone was able to solve it before. That's a really interesting answer, the learning that there are no rules. That's Yeah. And that's probably a, a hard habit to break of program to, you know, what are the rules in, in doing this? That's, I think, kind of how we are taught to learn. Learn right. the rules first and then you can break them instead of just thinking, going it, at it with the mindset of, uh, you know, a clean slate. And the best founders I know, like my friends who I have like the most confidence in and I'm sure they're going to be successful, are the ones who know how to break rules. And whenever I talk to them, they're always like, at the edge of some thing that I can't believe they've done. And then on the other side of that thing, they've always achieved something, which I can't believe they've achieved. And there are people for whom it's very consistent. Like every time I see them, they've done something surprising and new, and they're making surprising and new progress. And then there are people, when I talk to them, they say like, things are going really well, you know, and like, it's all in line with our expectations. And we've, like, you know, we've, we're, we've done the series of things that founders must do. We've raised money the way we're expected to raise money. My, my confidence level in them drops, you know, <laughs> uh, which may be counterintuitive, right? Because it's like, oh, yeah, congratulations. You successfully raised the round of funding you expected to raise at the number of months you expected to raise it. But um, there's something about being able to just totally beat the system that's required to make a company work. Right. What book do you recommend most? So I've been reading a bunch of management books recently because I'm trying to learn how to be a manager. And so uh, the best, absolute best book I've read, and I love it, is Creativity Inc., which is by the chairman of Pixar. And it's just such a good book about working with people and uh, enabling them. And it's also just great because Pixar is awesome and it's cool to read about the company. Yeah. 
Aside yeah. from books, what do you use to keep learning? Uh, like I said, mentors, advisors are totally my secret. I Every time I like see someone doing something awesome and I'm like, I admire that person, I write them an email and I'm like, hey, you do this thing super well that I wish I did really well. Would you meet with me and like tell me a little bit about how you do it? And probably 60% of the time they say yes, and probably 10% of the time that becomes like a long-standing relationship. Mm -hmm. But it's absolutely the thing that I learn most from. If you could create a tweet that would go totally viral, what would it say? I think it would just say, like, don't vote for Donald Trump. <laughs> the thing that gives me the most anxiety that's like totally outside of my control I have this like total fallacy in my head that the more I read about politics, like the better politics will get, you know, like I'm nervous about politics. Therefore I should go read more news and see if I can, you know, read my way into certainty about what will happen. But of course can't do that. So I think that if I could just like broadcast something, cause like mostly, you know, I'm pretty, pretty happy with my reach broadcasting wise, but yeah, that's probably what I would do. And then finally, um, is there anyone that you're looking, are you hiring, looking for customers who should contact you? Do you have any asks for the Liberty Entrepreneurs audience? Yeah, anyone who wants to talk about like authentication, I, anyone, like anyone who wants to use Clef or talk about how Clef could help their business, always looking for customers and happy to talk to folks. Uh, we're, I'm in fundraising mode right now, so if anyone's investing, they could also reach out. That means we're like in a slow hiring period, but hopefully soon we will be in a faster hiring period. So um, someone who might be looking for work in four to six months, uh, especially engineering, should definitely reach out. And what's your website and, and Twitter and email if you want to give it out? Yeah, getclef.com, G-E-T-C-L-E-F.com. I'm... I am B on Twitter, so I A M B. And my email address is just the letter B at getclef.com. Awesome. We will uh, put up some of these links in the show notes. B, thank you so much for sitting down and, and chatting with us. It was a great conversation. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Justin. <laughs>